at the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies in the Czech Republic. Uh, Jan's um, uh, political life has been a, a quite extraordinary one. He was a student activist uh, back in 1968 at the time of the uh, at the time of the Prague Spring uh, and the uprising against uh, the communist rule in what was then Czechoslovakia. Um, but he's been uh, a, a, a close uh, observer uh, since of uh, foreign affairs, international affairs. His background at the United Nations has uh, given him a unique vantage point. Uh, and of course, when he was at the UN and when he's been uh, at the Czech Foreign Ministry, uh, Jan will have been keeping very close uh, uh, tabs on what has been happening in the Middle East, as he is now. Um, and we're delighted uh, for him to join with us today. And we would love to hear from you, by the way. Um, do send in your questions. Uh, here at Palestine Deep Dive, um, we have been obviously keeping a very, very close uh, watch, reporting daily from uh, the Middle East, from Palestine, from Israel, and uh, providing the kind of uh, analysis, we think, uh, an investigation, uh, an information, and straightforward uh, plain news uh, that we feel that people uh, are find missing elsewhere in a lot of uh, um, mainstream media, I suppose. So we have a special opportunity to explore what a lot of people uh, are extremely concerned about, um, and that is uh, a conflict and the parameters of a conflict, uh, a conflict where uh, a, uh, a major military power uh, has effectively been using um, munitions uh, uh, in, in areas that uh, it, it either controls or it occupies. Uh, this isn't the first time, of course, um, and uh, we are looking at the situation in Gaza. There's a ceasefire at last, but after days of uh, heavy fighting in which a lot of civilians have died, uh, mostly Palestinians, um, the way that this has been presented very much in the media has been as a battle of equals. Well, I think that it's quite clear that anyone can see that it hasn't been a battle of equals and that actually if Israel is an occupying power, uh, which it is under international law, it has special responsibilities to those it occupies. So Jan, thank you very, very much for joining us from Prague today. It's great to see you. And I just I just wondered if I could begin by uh, by looking at the um, the origins of this latest round of fighting. Um, we're not going to go all the way back to the foundation of Israel or the, <clears throat> the Balfour Declaration, the division and the historical, uh, the historical basis for much of this. But the way in which the conflict has been reported has been very much as though uh, some, uh, Hamas missiles have been aimed at Israel and Israel has responded. Whereas in fact, what we do know is that uh, there was a reaction building up quite, for quite some time against forcible evictions in occupied East Jerusalem. Uh, we saw the demonstrations and we saw the response. So, Jan, if I just might begin with your vantage point and your knowledge of how the United Nations works, could, could you just basically outline the, um, the, legal, the legal situation that governs Israel's uh, occupation of East Jerusalem and the West Bank, um, and also its, uh, its containment of Gaza? What, what does international law require Israel to do and not to do? Ah, uh, thank you, Mark, for inviting me. Um, it's uh, a very sensitive and difficult subject, but I will try to tackle it. However, uh, at least uh, given my own experience with responding critically to uh, these situations um, on the media and public, um, let me first of all just uh, add a uh, few sentences. Um, as uh, I have been many times while supporting the Palestinian cause accused of um, anti-Semitism and, uh, and similar uh, absurdities. Uh, so let me just make clear that my father comes from a family where for several centuries there were only Jews. His mother and most of his relatives died in Auschwitz. Uh, he and his brother who escaped from Auschwitz fought in the Czechoslovak armies, both in the East and in the West. And my father in the early 50s was sentenced to 25 years imprisonment, among other things, for uh, trumped up charges of, of Zionism. Um, so uh, uh, I have been most of my life convinced that um, the struggle against anti-Semitism 
is an integral part of a struggle against all forms of uh, racism. I have now to your question. Um, uh, yes, you are right. The, 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 the latest uh, um, struggle between uh, uh, Gaza and Israel, uh, in fact, started uh, um, when um, Israeli court ruled that uh, I think 16 families, uh, Palestinian families, should be evicted in, um, in the Sheikh Jarrah quarter in East Jerusalem. And, and people, uh, people uh, protested, uh, obviously. Um, then a few days after that, about 70,000 Palestinians um, came to the Al-Aqsa uh, uh, mosque on, uh, and, um, and there was a nasty clash with the Israeli, Israeli police. Um, so uh, uh, to cut the story short, um, Hamas, which controls uh, Gaza, uh, gave a kind of ultimatum to Israel that they should um, stop the evictions, um, um, respect uh, peace in uh, East Jerusalem. Um, and if they don't do that, they will um, start uh, um, firing rockets at, at Israel, um, which from the various responses, it seems that the Israeli government didn't quite believe it. However, Israel fulfilled its promise and uh, and then started uh, um, firing some rockets at, at Israel. Israel responded, and you had 11 days of uh, what you correctly called uh, a battle of highly unequal uh, to two sides. Um, before I go to the battle itself, um, as you asked about international law, uh, as you yourself made clear, Israel as an occupying power um, uh, has to uh, obey the law, which makes clear that uh, the, the protected population um, has to be protected against forcible transfer uh, of it uh, uh, under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And this is what Israel has been doing, not just now, but, uh, but in fact, for, for years. In fact, I looked it up uh, just last year, about uh, over 12,000 uh, settlements um, created uh, in violation of both the UN Charter and the 1998 uh, Rome Statute of the ICC. So, um, and it has to be also clear that, as you know yourself, uh, the UN Resolution uh, 2334, which uh, makes clear that uh, uh, settlement activities should be seized, uh, has been also violated by, by these activities, in particular recently in, in East Jerusalem. So, um, even before the actual battle started, international law has been uh, violated uh, by these um, evictions in East, in East Jerusalem. Um, then, of course, uh, I do agree on one hand that uh, Hamas fires rockets indiscriminately against uh, Israel. Um, uh, primarily because they're not capable technologically uh, of uh, targeting any, uh, any aims in, in Israel. Um, their technology is not comparable at all to the most sophisticated uh, equipment which Israel has. So in a sense, uh, uh, firing rockets uh, indiscriminately at, uh, at uh, Israel, which could uh, hit civilians, is also a war crime. However, I don't think it's quite comparable to the terrible destruction which Israel inflicted on Gaza. Um, it's slightly less than in 2014, but it's still absolutely um, devastating when hospitals are destroyed, water supplies destroyed, um, electricity um, has been um, uh, damaged, the sewage system has been uh, wrecked. 
In, in fact, the infrastructure uh, is so damaged that it will take years to, to uh, improve or to repair, um, not comparable at all to uh, the damage caused by the rockets in, um, in, in Israel. Uh, so that to me is also a clear violation of, uh, uh, of international law because uh, let me uh, remind you, as you say, the law makes clear uh, that uh, uh, harm to civilians uh, must be proportionate uh, to the military advantage um, derived from, uh, from any attack. And this is this is key that has not not happened here. It's not proportionate at all, uh, despite Israel claims. Um, many buildings, about one thousand buildings, have been destroyed, but many of them uh, cannot be described as military targets at all, including uh, ice cream factory um, um, or residential buildings. Some Israeli officials claim that it's a large Israeli, uh, sorry, uh, Gaza residential building where whole families have been killed. There was a, a suspicion that one Hamas official lived, um, which is, uh, um, uh, to me, an absurd uh, justification. So uh, the, the harm done to civilians has not been proportionate, and that's another violation of, uh, of international law. Well, Jan, if I might just come in there, I mean, I'll discuss Gaza in a little bit more detail in a minute. But if I could just return to um, East Jerusalem and also to the to the West Bank, um, where you were talking about the uh, the court orders effectively evicting 16 families. I think it's either six or 16 families. Um, but the question is, uh, I mean, do you know, you know what legal rights Israeli courts would have uh, in East Jerusalem. I, I was under. The, I thought that East Jerusalem was officially, um, actually governed separately, supposedly by through the United Nations. So it's, it's actually a, a, a an Israeli court shouldn't really have jurisdiction in East Jerusalem. Well, that is, that is correct. Uh, however, Israeli court ignored that uh, and have been treating East Jerusalem as part of what they would call unified uh, Jerusalem, which they still argue um, it's the uh, capital, or they would like to treat it as their capital. And in fact, uh, I think it's uh, extraordinary that some states, including member states of the United Nations, have uh, accepted this argument and transferred their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, including the United States. And um, in terms of uh, certain officials, uh, uh, certain offices, even my own country, um, has done that. Um, um, that is in violation of international law because, the, um, as you correctly said, Jerusalem or East Jerusalem is not acknowledged as part of uh, 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 Israel. Um, however, the Israeli courts do regularly uh, rule um, over. Uh, mm. number of issues in East Jerusalem, including the eviction I mentioned in Sheikh Jarrah, which uh, the Israelis argue is uh, uh, an order from Israeli court. And therefore they were just implementing by evicting these people from their homes and trying to um, create way for uh, new Israeli settlers, some of them imported from abroad, uh, that they were simply implementing um, uh, a court order from Israeli court, um, but in my opinion, that's contrary to uh, the official uh, UN acknowledged status of uh, East Jerusalem. Um, this is, of course, a result of the 1967 war, where Israel occupied a uh, large part of the West Bank and uh, and uh, and Jerusalem, and since then. Israel has been trying to evict as many Palestinian families from East Jerusalem and replace them with Israelis in a, in a, in a way of creating a Judaization of Jerusalem 
and therefore then confronting the international community eventually with the fait accompli that in fact the whole of Israel is occupied and, uh, um, and by Israelis who reside there. Uh, that in, in my opinion is a gradual step-by-step violation of the uh, official status of East Jerusalem. Yeah, and on this, I mean, it's it, this is a slightly separate matter, but of course, um, what we have witnessed over the past uh, uh, few weeks is not only what's been happening in Gaza and East Jerusalem, but uh, within Israel proper itself, around Lod and other um, Israeli-Palestinian uh, towns and cities where there's a there's a mixed uh, residency. Um, not everybody fled uh, in 1948. A lot, a, a large number of Palestinians. Some 20 percent, I think, of Israel's population is Palestinian. Um, it's not against international law necessarily for the, for what is apparently the New York Times are reporting today is a, is a plan to effectively push forward um, in Israel's mixed towns to make them more Jewish. So there's a there's this the process that you've just been outlining that's been underway illegally in East Jerusalem uh, has also been underway um, or is underway, says the New York Times and others um, in Israel proper itself. Uh, so it does look from that and from, from what you're saying that uh, there is a, obviously uh, a, a whole process um, that's underway. But I'm just wondering if I, if I could move on perhaps to Gaza, um, because we've talked about um, international law. There is, there is uh, a, an, official, um, an official formal complaint, an, a, a, a demand that's gone into the uh, International Criminal Court um, prosecutor, uh, I think her name is uh, Fatou Pensuka, or Pensuda, um, and that's come from the uh, Reporters Without Borders. Reporters Without Borders have said that uh, they believe that Israel has actually been in direct violation of Resolution 2222 of 2015, which is to um, uh, essentially um, protect journalists under the Geneva Conventions and also under the Rome Statute. And you just mentioned um, when you were talking about what happened in Gaza, uh, what had also, uh, you know, the, the number of buildings that were hit and uh, that, that did not contain uh, people who could be attached to Hamas or who could be accused of being combatants, including journalists. Um, I think a number of news agencies, including um, Associated Press and Al Jazeera, had had their offices blown up. Um, what I suppose people, it's a very long uh, a question of mine, <laughs> I mean, the actual question, but the, the build up to it. But I think what people want to know is if a complaint is made like that uh, and a demand for an investigation, what happens? Uh, and we already know that the International Criminal Court is investigating alleged war crimes from a previous uh, military incursion into Gaza by Israel. Um, but people would like to know what, what happens and what happens, especially when other countries, especially such as the United States, which does not recognize the International Criminal Court or Britain, which does, but which uh, condemns the investigation. What happens um, to these investigations if responsible, supposedly responsible global powers say we don't really pay much regard to it? Yeah, this is unfortunately a correct description, what you just said. Um, I think the ICC is doing a very good job um, and is investigating correctly, uh, not only this one, but other uh, similar complaints. Um, but as you know, uh, ICC came to um, very unpleasant conclusions about Israel. Um, and in some documents, uh, it has uh, described the persecution and discrimination of Palestinians on its territory um, as apartheid, um, which is a very strong, strong word. Um, but it's uh, used also by some Israeli human rights organizations like Bethlehem. Um, and more recently, surprisingly to me, after many years, uh, even in a, in a document issued by the Human Rights Watch, I think called the Threshold Crossed, um, where similar tough terminology was used, uh, similar to the ones used by the ICC. Um, yeah, in fact, before I go further, uh, what you described by journalists is, is absolutely correct. The, the, the high-rise building where 
offices of uh, Associated Press and Al Jazeera um, were located, which was bombed. Um, but this is only one most uh, publicized example. In fact, uh, um, the Gazans claim that 23 officers uh, of um, international um, and, uh, and Arab media have been destroyed uh, during the 10-day, uh, 11-day uh, bombing. So journalists uh, have been, uh, I would say, uh, a target, which indicates that uh, Israel is, is unhappy about the, uh, the publicity, uh, especially publicity sent by journalists who are actually stationed in Gaza um, and can supply um, visual and, and other material about the consequences of the bombing. Um, but uh, uh, going back to your question about ICC, unfortunately, um, I believe that, of course, uh, ICC will eventually upheld the complaint. And given their past uh, uh, record, I believe that they will probably find Israel guilty. However, Israel is not recognizing uh, ICC. Um, and and in, in the past, uh, it criticized the conclusions uh, that were not very much published in Israel, maybe with the exception of, uh, of Haaret. And um, therefore, uh, although I think it will help the international uh, recognition of what's happening in, in, uh, in the area, in practice, uh, I don't think ICC has the power of uh, uh, forcing Israel to amend its uh, its actions. Mm -hmm. um, I think Israel will, will continue to ignore the ICC conclusions. Um, in fact, some Palestinians who are, of course, very happy about what ICC does, but they say that the Israelis treat ICC almost as it was a, a, a Palestinian court, which, of course, it is not. Um, and therefore, uh, as I said, the the practical impact of the ICC conclusions is limited. Mm. I mean, there's a saying here, as you know, Jan, about the, the long hand of the law, uh, and it's quite possible that um, in former Yugoslavia and in Liberia uh, and in Rwanda, um, people who were accused of and subsequently found guilty of war crimes, uh, eventually uh, the law did catch up with them. Uh, I noticed today uh, in Haaretz, there's, a, there's a, uh, an editorial essentially asking the question, is Israel beginning to look like uh, the former Yugoslavia? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's an interesting point in itself. But do you think, I mean, it's, it's I mean, we, we mentioned briefly the, the crystal ball. And so, you know, this is, a, we're in the realm of, uh, of, of, of speculation. But do you think that there is a possibility further down the line, one day, that those uh, who have um, if the International Criminal Court does find them in breach of international law, do you think there's a possibility that one day uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and others in his administration could face justice? Uh, I would like that. I hope so, but I'm not very optimistic that it will happen in the uh, in foreseeable future. In fact, ironically, uh, uh, as you know, the one of the results of the recent uh, um, battle between Hamas and Israel is that it strengthened the government of Netanyahu. Um, before uh, 7th of May, it looked that uh, he will lose power. And in fact, the opposition was just about to form um, an alternative government. Um, and down the road, he could even be convicted by Israeli court of, of corruption. So it looked for some time that this is the final end of many years of Bibi's uh, stay in power. However, the result uh, of, of these battles is that on one hand, uh, Bertanhau is back in power. Uh, the opposition obviously cannot uh, uh, include among the Neset members which who supported the Arab uni uni Unified uh, uh, List. And therefore, they cannot get the 61 necessary uh, uh, Neset MPs. Um, and thus, 
Netanyahu, in my opinion, will uh, almost certainly continue in uh, in power. Um, unfortunately, on the other hand, in fact, uh, to be fair, uh, the uh, the battles also strengthened politically uh, Hamas um, in comparison with Fatah and the uh, and the Palestinian Authority. Um, therefore, if the elections which were planned in May and which Abbas under Israeli pressure um, uh, cancelled recently, if those elections would have taken place, in my opinion, just now, Hamas would score uh, a resounding victory. Um, despite, as I said, the devastating destruction in, in Gaza. Politically, uh, uh, it helped on one hand Hamas and on the other hand uh, Netanyahu. And Netanyahu is definitely committed to ignore um, ICC or um, all the other uh, NGOs you, you, you mentioned and will continue with uh, ignoring the rights of Palestinians to self-determination, etc. Mm. In my opinion, of course, despite the fact that it's now even more distant possibility, in my opinion, in long term, only a two-state solution, um, which in fact, uh, I, I was uh, interested to, to note, even President, uh, US President Biden mentioned recently that it's, uh, it, it's still on, on the table. I think it's, it's less and less visible on the table, but in long term, comparing with all the other alternatives, it seems to me that it's the only possibility we should work for um, a sovereign, democratic, independent, and viable Palestinian state uh, to exist alongside uh, Israel, secure in its pre-1967 borders. Um, that I still believe the international community, including UN, should fight for, but the current Netanyahu's government um, is definitely not uh, interested in uh, implementing that. It would have to come under much greater international pressure, in particular from the United States. Um, well, Jan, if I might come in there and just to, to, to move from so beyond international law and the UN to, um, to the United States, where, uh, you know, that clearly if Prime Minister Netanyahu doesn't listen to the UN, he does, he does have to listen to the US. Um, and certainly at the beginning of this latest round of uh, fighting, uh, there was an initial reluctance, it seemed, of the Biden administration to get particularly deeply enmeshed in all of this. It did dispatch a special envoy, not of the stature uh, that previous administrations might have done back in the days of Kissinger, for instance, but they did. Um, and um, there was what was interesting uh, as a development was the pressure that was building up within the Democratic Party and outside. Um, took pressure on President Biden to actually become rather more involved than he wanted to. And so it would appear that uh, at some stage in the past few days, President Biden has told Netanyahu there has to be a ceasefire and he needs to stop. Um, that's, that seems to be well-informed speculation, uh, information possibly too, that Biden intervened in such a way. So do you think, I mean, looking to more politically rather than looking at international law, that um, the, the, there, are, there are moves afoot within the United States for a change, that actually the Democratic Party is changing in composition and in its demographics. Uh, and this, this sort of 100% support for Israel, which usually is the case, is beginning to fracture. No, I, I very much believe so. And uh, in fact, I'm convinced that um, the indirect behind the scenes, uh, uh, President Biden's and US pressure contributed uh, to the ceasefire. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the nitty-gritty was negotiated primarily by the Egyptians with the help of Qatar and some others. But if it wasn't for US uh, pressure, it wouldn't happen. Uh, and in fact, uh, it seems all the information says that there was a certain discrepancy between what um, US president has publicly announced um, and what he actually said to Netanyahu in telephone conversations, where he was much tougher and made it very clear that the United States wants uh, an early ceasefire, which then took place. Uh, so I would agree with you on, on, on that. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I think this is a result of a, a slowly changing situation within the US. 
and in particular within the Democratic Party, where the left has not won the elections. Um, I would have liked, for example, Bernie Sanders to be now in the White House. Um, but the left in the Democratic Party is now much stronger than it was, for example, in 2014, when there was the latest uh, big war between uh, Hamas and, uh, and, and Israel. And, and some of the speeches I've, I've read and heard uh, made in the Congress by some Democratic, uh, represent, Democratic Party representatives, um, including the four um, uh, left-wingers, uh, were very, very tough. Um, and it seems to me that President Biden realized that he cannot any longer ignore this kind of pressure from within his own party. I hope this will continue. And I hope that more American uh, democratic politicians will, will join in this pressure. Because um, although, as you know, I'm a great uh, fan of United Nations, um, but in reality, uh, if there is any power which could compel the Israeli government to change its course, it's not the UN, but the US. Um, and here I hope that the pressure from the progressives, as they call themselves, or the left of the Democratic Party on Biden will, will continue and that we will see some change. I hope it will not follow the, uh, the example of President Obama. I mean, when Obama started as president, he made some fantastic speeches in Cairo, as you remember, mm -hmm. where he acknowledged the Palestinian rights to self-determination, um, made it very clear that uh, uh, the dream about uh, independent sovereign Jewish state cannot uh, be implemented with unless Palestinians enjoy uh, self-determination and their own sovereign state. Um, later, he watered down, uh, or at least under pressure from his from his uh, surroundings, as Kissinger uh, made it very, or Brzezinski, I think, made it very clear. Um, um, I hope that Biden will not uh, experience uh, 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 the similar process and just the contrary that his beginning of a tougher attitude to Bibi's government will in fact uh, rather than be diminished uh, be increased because that's the only that's the only hope. Thank you Jan. I mean we haven't got an awful lot longer but we have got a question here and this is from um, Philippe Palava and Philippe says uh, Jan would an ICC judgment not permit sanctions on external visits of Israeli politicians? In other words, would this prevent uh, Israeli politicians from traveling elsewhere in the world? Uh, and if that was the case, well, that, that would certainly be another small victory for the Palestinians, wouldn't it? Um, uh, yes, that is, that is true. Um, and, and in fact, uh, some sanctions, including the um, moves to, to ban import from uh, products, uh, um, which were which are produced at the, in the occupied territories, um, and that kind of boycott is is some countries quite successful. But as you know, it's not successful everywhere. It's not recognized, for example, by the United States, and therefore, um, even if the ICC does impose some sanctions, which I would welcome, I'm sure United States, which does not recognize ICC, as you mentioned yourself earlier. Um, sanctions imposed by ICC, United States will continue to ignore. And it is uh, their best uh, ally and partner, both in terms of trade, but it also in terms of supply of most te uh, technological, technologically developed uh, weapons, including the, um, uh, uh, the Iron Dome uh, uh, defense system, etc. cetera. Um, so I think, with, unfortunately, pragmatically speaking, without a certain change of the US policy uh, towards uh, Israel, uh, all these other sanctions are to be welcomed, but they are more symbolic than real. Mm. Well, I mean, finally, I mean, we, we, we should just do a little bit of crystal ball gazing. <laughs> I, know, I know it's always a risky thing to do, but I mean, on the whole, Jan, would you say that you're... Um, an optimist or a pessimist and looking at, at what we've just gone through in the last two or three weeks and particularly what people have gone through in um, Gaza and in Israel but mainly in Gaza do you think that the situation 
remains the same? Or do you think things are changing? Do you think there's a greater understanding of the situation in the Middle East and especially pertaining for the situation in Palestine? Um, where do you think we could be in 10, 20 years time? Because clearly this, this constant round of fighting and war is not really getting anybody anywhere. No, I agree with you. Now, if you are giving me uh, a time scale of 10 to 20 years, which is quite a long time indeed, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, as I complained earlier, you didn't supply me with the crystal ball, so I have to uh, make only some informed uh, guesses. My hope is that in 10, 20 years' time, uh, we will have uh, a two-state solution, um, and we will have a much more informed uh, international public opinion uh, on the situation there. And in fact, unfortunately, um, I change the word, uh, um, I still think that the, the, the devastation imposed on Gaza by the recent fighting uh, is, is terrible and it will take years and years uh, to remedy. However, um, I also have to acknowledge that these battles uh, led to a much better understanding of the international community of what this conflict is really about. So, although economically and in terms of uh, human lives, 230 people dead, out of which 61 children, 36 women, um, and economy and infrastructure destroyed um, on one hand. But politically, uh, paradoxically, Hamas has gained. Um, an international community is beginning to become much more aware than in the past of what the conflict is about. That, to me, is a source of hope and uh, you ask me if I'm optimist or, or pessimist. I describe myself as a cautious optimist. Um, uh, sometimes I put more emphasis on the word cautious, sometimes on the word optimism. But cautious optimist means that within the time scale you gave me, 10 to 20 years, I, I do believe that um, the desire of the Gazans uh, to end the blockade, end the occupation, um, and get certain dignity and freedom for themselves will be implemented because, as you say, without moves towards that aim, um, you will have these uh, battles uh, renewed every time. Last time was 2014, but it was even before. So this is about a fourth war within a relatively short time. And in fact, the ceasefire uh, does not contain any guarantees that it will not happen again. Um, none of the conditions put forward either by Israel or by Hamas have been uh, implemented or taken. The ceasefire is only end of shooting. And uh, that means that all the problems which are on the table, which caused the recent uh, confrontation, um, are still there. And, uh, and therefore it can happen again. Unless United States, helped by United Nations and other countries, um, will begin to uh, force a certain change. Well, finally, um, you mentioned other countries there, Jan. Um, what about the uh, European Union? Um, do you think the European Union could be taking a much stronger lead on this? Yes, I do hope so. I, I mean, in my opinion, European Union, uh, as in the past and, and even recently adopted uh, a much better um, perception and, and conclusions towards uh, um, this conflict than the United States. Um, it is unfortunate, from my point of view, as a supporter of the European Union, that the recent uh, resolution was uh, vetoed by Hungary um, and uh, only confirms uh, and strengthens my conviction that these resolutions do not need to be unanimous, uh, but should uh, be subjected to a majority vote, uh, as one country vetoed it. Um, within the European Union, including my own government, uh, which is fairly pro-Israeli, um, and sometimes Austrian and Slovenian governments uh, uh, join them. But the majority of EU member states 
are critical, very critical of uh, uh, the Israeli behavior towards uh, uh, Palestinians, including Gazans. And therefore, I do believe that the uh, European Union, uh, where the atmosphere of criticism towards Israel was strengthened by the recent confrontation, I do believe that the European Union uh, will play a more decisive and stronger role than it did up to now. And with the help of um, UN and other organizations, it will help to increase pressure on, on, on United States. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Jan Kavan. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today from Prague. Uh, and thank you to all of you who joined us. I'm sorry we couldn't get all of your questions in. Um, we'd love to have you back again, Jan, and uh, hopefully in, in happier times. But uh, thank you once again, and thank you to everybody at Palestine Deep Dive uh, for making this happen. Uh, and until next time, it's uh, goodbye from me and uh, goodbye from Jan in Prague. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I do apologize that uh, I didn't have the possibility of answering all the questions. But as you said, I hope that 